You're listening to the Kelly Green Hour for the Always Next Year Podcast Studio Network. You can find the team on our Twitter, at ANY Podcast, or visit us on our website, www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. And now, to bring us in, the Jack Dolls. On that son of a bitch again. He cracked up in a river too. He beat me Sunday through and through. And so she go to my unconscious frame. I want me healthy sheriff fights. Well, lucky son still have me life since Mickey Flynn beat me dumb and lame. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the Kelly Green Hour here on the Always Next Year podcast. I'm your host, LG Harrell, and joining me today is Connor Donald. Connor, how you doing, my friend? It, I am doing great. It feels great to be talking on a, a victory green hour. We'll yeah, call it hey, that. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this is our review of week one's game against the Washington Redskins, in which the Philadelphia Eagles defeated the Washington Redskins 32-27. to 27, Sorry. Um, the Eagles. But I mean, we should preface this by saying that score is a lot closer than it should be. It, yeah, it was. Yeah, and, we, and we'll definitely talk about that because, again, Jim Schwartz is getting on the bad side of a bunch of Philadelphia fans, which isn't shocking because Philadelphia fans, even though we won the Super Bowl with the guy as a defensive coordinator, his philosophy as a defensive coordinator, sting, it, it gets into the it, it just bothers Philadelphia fans because we're so used to that it, Jim it should, Johnson, Buddy It bothers, Buddy everybody. Ryan. It bothers yeah, we, everybody. I talk to other people, and you're sitting there, and you're, you're watching your corners play. Ten like yards off. Ten yards off. No pressure from the linebackers. Just four going at it every you time, every blitz, time. Yeah. Nothing changes, and, and we're going to talk about that because I, I feel – that something needs to change. But first, let's go over the scoring of the game. Again, the Philadelphia Eagles defeated the Washington Redskins 32-27. to They are 1-0, while Washington is 0-1. Early in the first quarter, the Washington Redskins jumped out to a 7 month lead after a Vernon Davis 48-yard catch and run. Andrew Sendejo uh, looked like a deer in headlights as he couldn't keep his feet. And then Ronald Darby had his head down, missed a tackle. Um... Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Three or four other guys missed tackles, and that play was an ugly start to the game. And I don't know about you, but I, I sat back going, oh, my God, here we go again. I mean, I'm just saying I was a guy who said at least get him out for one series during the preseason. So well, well, well. Was well, this not to be expected? The, the defense actually did play. I mean, Darby didn't, but Darby didn't, Sendejo, no. Sendejo was on the field a lot during the preseason. Jenkins got on the field um, in game two and game three. Uh, Ronnie McLeod got out on the field in game three. So the defense in particular, except, you know, Fletcher Cox and Derek Barnett. They I got guess it's play. an unfair jab. OK, I get I wanted to get that jab in for the offense more than the uh, defense. Let me get, let me get it to works. the offense first. <laughs> All right. So then the uh, late in the first quarter, the Washington Redskins jumped out to a 10 nothing lead after Dustin Hopkins, 41 yard field goal. And then in the second quarter early on, Terry McLaurin with a 69 yard touchdown reception from Case Keenum after their According to, I think it was Rodney McLeod, he was on WIP this week, they tried to disguise something, and obviously it didn't work. There was no safety in the middle of the field, and McLaren just ran by Rasul Douglas for the 69-yard touchdown. And that made Washington's lead 17 points as they jumped out to a 17 nothing lead. And nobody in their right mind thought that the Eagles, who were favored by 10.5 points at game time, were going to be down 17 nothing at any point in this game. No, definitely not. I, I mean, that was crazy. I, as soon as they fell behind like that, I, I was like, I had the Eagles on and I had Red Zone on, and I was like, this is not, this is not good. Were, okay, so when it was seventeen nothing, were you worried at all? No, K- no, kind of, but kind of, but I'm not gonna be like like Twitter worried. I wasn't Twitter worried about this game. Like they were like the game's over, it's done, it's they we have no chance. And but I, I wasn't that worried because it's not the first time we've seen the Eagles do that. It's certainly not the first time in the first game of the season. Yeah, if you remember Jacksonville. We've seen the Eagles do that. The Jacksonville game, I think it was five years ago, 
or four or six years ago, Jacksonville jumped out to a what seven fourteen nothing seventeen nothing lead, and they went into the halftime up that much. And then in the third quarter, Darren Sproles jumped or uh, ripped off like a fifty yard touchdown run on fourth down and helped the Eagles come back in that game. So yeah, you're right. It was which we will talk about in a little bit. It was and you could just expected. you could tell like the offense just wasn't there the first half. I mean, minus yeah, I have the, I the have the next my... score and play that you're going to talk about, but yeah. I have my theories as to why, but as you mentioned, the Eagles about five and a half minutes later of game time were able to get on the board with a welcome back to Sean Jackson, 51 yard touchdown pass from Carson Wentz. It was a beautiful pass. Everybody talks about how Carson can't throw the deep ball. Well, when you have somebody who at the age of 32 looks quicker than he was when he was 24, you ain't got to worry about it. You're not going to out overthrow Deshaun Jackson and Josh Norman, was the right guy to have on Jackson at that time. As good as Josh Norman is, he can't run with Deshaun Jackson. And it was a beautiful pitch and catch as the Eagles finally got on the board on that 51 yard touchdown reception. It was a beautiful play. And and I just, I jumped right up. I was there. So this was the day after the hurricane. So my brother came over and my dad came over cause they had no power. So, but I had power. So everyone, like everyone, you know, you guys, had a hurricane up, you guys had a hurricane well, up there. I mean, it, it, it hurt Halifax, which is three hours away as a hurricane. Okay. But here we got like tropical stormish thing going on. So we lost okay. power everywhere. But I had the power. So Sunday football was at my house. Nice. So I jumped right out of my seat when I saw that. I was like, oh, yeah, here we go. That was that was a, that was a turning point. That's where I gained a, a bit of confidence, and and you always love the Deshaun Jackson revenge game when you're not on the receiving end of it. <laughs> he he tends to burn his, his former teams. He did it to us a lot. He was like five and one against us with the Redskins or something like that. It's crazy, but you could see um, Carson Wentz just veer back his arm and, and launch it. It was the perfect play. And then to end the first half, Dustin Hopkins kicked a 48 yard field goal because when the Redskins were going to spike the ball, Derek Barnett was off sides. They are just spiking the ball. What goes through his head? Derek Barnett seems to be off sides at least two, three, four times a game. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of, of like reminiscent of the D forward thing yeah. for well, the this, Chiefs. I was like, what was, are you? Was pretty bad. Yeah, I was like, I was like, what are you? What are you doing? Like, it's so simple, especially at that time in the game. Just watch where your feet are. It's just simple things when you have seconds to go. And this is what's going down. It just and it made that fi- the basics. Just make sure you got the basics down. It made a what would have been a 53-yard field goal attempt slightly easier at 48 yards, and he nailed it. So Washington went in at the half up 20 to seven, or <clears throat> yeah, 20 to seven. Excuse me. Then in the third quarter, the Philadelphia Eagles they woke up. The first half was their preseason, and halfway through the third quarter Alshon Jeffrey with a five-yard touchdown reception from Carson Wentz Carson Wentz showing his escapability now when he gets out the pocket he doesn't look to run his eyes are still downfield and I don't know how many quarterbacks make that throw that Carson Wentz made it it wasn't sidearm but but he got it just under the linebacker's arm who was in the back of the end zone with Alshon Jeffrey and it was just a great play by Carson Wentz and as Ike Reese of WIP's uh, Marks and Reese Show says they need to let the Bronco buck because when in the first half when Carson Wentz was pretty much seemed like to just be in the pocket, it really didn't work that well. Get him out, let him use his feet, let him use his vision, and things started flowing for the Eagles in the second half. Yeah, I mean, I know that we're really nervous and you like cringe when he leaves the pocket, but that's where Wentz does his best work. When he's in the pocket, he's scrambling to get out of the pocket, and once he's out, it's like fresh set of eyes. He sees a whole nother field when there's not people in front of him, despite how tall Wentz is. And I mean, that, that play, like I it's all, it's still all over Twitter. Like my, I bet your QB can't do this. And <laughs> it was a beautiful play, a thing of beauty went under one arm and then raid right in through another Redskins arms. And there was Jeffrey. It was a great play by, by Wentz and Jeffrey. A couple minutes later, after the Eagles got a three and out, Carson Wentz finds Deshaun Jackson once again on a 53-yard touchdown. Another 50-yard-plus bomb. Deshaun Jackson is second all-time in the NFL with 50-plus-yard touchdowns. He's got 31. First place, 
Jerry Rice has 36. You'd have to think that Deshaun Jackson is going to break that record before his NFL career is, is over. His speed doesn't look to be going anywhere. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if if you're putting up, I mean, so I, I've been talking about this because, you know, I talk fantasy football a lot. I'm all over Twitter with the fantasy football. So, I mean, we can't expect this week in and week out from him. But, I mean, oh, if no. you're putting up games where you're getting eight, six to eight receptions and you're up over 100 yards, oh, yeah, that record will be well, my null- thing is, nullified. My thing is everybody knew Deshaun was going to go off week one, except Shane, who didn't put him in his starting lineup in fantasy. But um, everybody knew that Deshaun Jackson was going to go off week one. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if we're, we're going to, you know, later in the week we're going to discuss the Eagles and Falcons game. But, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if this week he goes two catches, ten yards, just because that's he's, he's a fem, fem, you know, femur fast type of guy. You know, he's going to get eight catches for 150 yards or we'll have two catches for 15 yards and, you know, we'll see, we'll see what he does the next week. But everybody knew that Deshaun Jackson was going to go off in his return to the link in midnight green and the two 50 yard touchdown catches, even the Redskins knew like, okay. So last year in week two at at the Buccaneers, the Eagles knew first play of the game was going to him. What, what happened? He still had a 75 yard touchdown catch. So like, even if teams know it coming, it's coming, he still runs right by the last line of defense because his speed is unmatched in the NFL. Oh, absolutely. You just know if you have him on fantasy and he's ever had a history against the team that he's going up against, just put him in your lineup. Oh, yes. How many times does he have to show you? He's all about that revenge game and not just one revenge game. He'll probably go off against the Skins later on in the season. That's the benefit of playing the Redskins twice. Oh, yeah. And we have Jackson for a couple years. That, that's the benefit. We, he's going to see them four or six times before he's out of Eagles green. Maybe even more. It all depends. Yeah, he's so, going to retire. He's going to retire an Eagle, in my, in my opinion. Uh, you, have to, you have to assume that at this point. I mean, as long as, long as Chip Kelly is nowhere near the Eagles <laughs> ever again, which I saw like he's like 2-14 and 14 since returning to college ball. So um, yeah, they, we, they, we, we, we they ruined They lost to him. San Diego State last weekend for the first time ever. Yeah, you see, he... Uh, UCLA thought they were getting a sure thing and he just can't do it anymore. I have no idea where his coach Philly destroyed him. Philly ruined him and he ruined us. So it was a mutually ruining relationship. Yeah. Right. All right. So the Philadelphia Eagles after that 53 yard touchdown catch from Deshaun Jackson took their first lead of the game at 21, 20 entering the fourth quarter, the first play of fourth quarter, the Eagles with a, a quick uh, screen pass out to Alshon Jeffrey, who took it into yards for a run. And then Doug Peterson, with the team up 27-20, decides to go for two, which is understandable. If you kick a field goal, you're up eight. It's still one score. You miss or you go for two and you make it. You're up two scores. Even if you miss it, you're still up seven. So it was a smart, you know, nobody likes this word, but analytics told him to go for two. He went for it. And Darren Scrolls, man, he made, like, that little pitch out. And even though he fell, he still powered his way into the end zone. And then if, if I don't know if there's any Jordan Howard, probably, but I don't know if there's a runner that runs harder than um, Darren Sproles, even at his uh, for pound for pound, he's the hardest runner in the NFL. I don't care what anybody says. Oh yeah. Darren Sproles is uh, when he said he was thinking about coming back and it was going to be with a team he'd already been. I was like, come back to Philly. You know, that's where you want to be. You know, that's where you belong. That, that mentality, that, that the way he, the heart he plays with that belongs in Philadelphia. And if, if the price was right, there's no reason not to put him in behind what we had coming out of that backfield in Sanders and Howard. H- how many people can say Sproles is your third back? Well, like, we're going to discuss this, uh, but Week one, he definitely wasn't the third back. I'm pretty sure he had most touches, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. And then to finish out the scoring in the game, Jake Elliott with a 22-yard field goal with three minutes left to give the Eagles a 12-point lead. And then as to, as uh, the clock was winding down and, you know, Jim Schwartz, our, everybody's, defense. everybody's favorite defensive coordinator, decided to go prevent and allowed the Redskins to go downfield as Trey Quinn uh, made or caught a four-yard touchdown from Case Keenum. And then the Redskins attempted an onside kick, which the Eagles recovered. Case Keenum finished with 380 yards passing, three touchdowns. Wentz, 28 of 39, 313 yards and three touchdowns. The key stat for Wentz, he 
He was 12 of 13 on third down. That's the 2017 MVP Wentz that we did not see last year. He is keyed Mm -hmm. in. He's healthy, and he is on a mission. That's how you know Wentz is healthy, when he is killing it on third down, because we, I'm pretty sure we were like one of the biggest stats that that Eagles fans love to throw around and that Eagles reporters love to throw around in 2017 was how good we were on third down, Mm -hmm. third and long, third and short, third and any time there was third and something on there, we were, we were converting. And that's, that's how, you know, Wentz is back right there. Third down statistics. Yep. He was just, he was money. He, he's the best quarterback on third down when he's on. Uh, some other stats, Deshaun Jackson, as we mentioned, finished 154 yards, an average of 19.3 yards per carry, two touchdowns. Both of those catches were a total of 104 yards, so averaging 52 yards on his two touchdown catches. Terry McLaurin had seven, uh, five catches, excuse me, for 125 yards, and a touchdown also dropped another one, which if he catches that ball, that gives the Redskins a lead in the third quarter and maybe changes the complexion of the game. Yeah, oh, I agree. When I saw that job, man, oh, oof. I felt he, that in my yeah, heart. He ran by Sidney Jones on that one. Um, I know, that one That one was lucky. I mean, you. I remember you messaging me about Rasul Douglas. Boys, <laughs> if, if that had got by on Sidney Jones, you, you and Shane would have been hearing something. Yeah, and then the rushing, uh, rushing totals, excuse me, for the Eagles. Darren Sproles had nine carries for 47 yards. Jordan Howard, six for 44. And Miles Sanders had 11 for 25. So it was an uh, all around. Let's not forget his longest was 19. A little underwhelming in his first game. Well, I don't see. The Eagles didn't really run the ball that much. Like they definitely passed. To well, he also did have a, a rushing touchdown, which got nullified, nullified on a BS, which on a the NFL, holding call, which the NFL said that they got it wrong. So of course they got it wrong. And that was the one that was on JJ Ortega Whiteside, right? Uh, yep. Was that yeah, the, they yeah. called like it was a holder. I can't remember yeah, the and, play, but they told Ortega, them that it was erroneous. So it's like, oh, good. I I love when they come out and and say that they made an error. Because I saw people on Twitter like, we, we should probably be doing what the Saints fans did, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, no, it, it was only game one. But still, it, it was definitely an egregious call because there's no... Ortega Whiteside just bullied his, the defender. He manhandled the defender. I would have refs not it's used not to It's not his seeing. fault. I mean, exactly. look at the size of him. Exactly. Um, so, what were some of your takeaways from the game? Um, you know... What is? Give me a couple good takeaways and give me a couple bad takeaways, and, and we can kind of discuss that a little bit. Uh, well, I guess I'll start with the bad, and I think the bad is is obvious. It's, it's the same bad that we've been talking about for like five years now. The secondary, it, the, the secondary, the, corners, the need, safeties are good. The, the corners, the corners, yeah, the corners. They need. I I don't know. I think me me and uh, Shane talked about it on crossing borders, and we. I mean have some confidence it's clear that jim schwartz just it doesn't seem like he has confidence in his corners to be able to do the job and when me and uh, shane were talking about it on cross boards we were saying let rasul douglas get up there he's a physical guy no i agree with you i will agree he is not meant to go chasing a terry mclaurin who has 95th percentile speed and burst that's not who he is he's meant to get up on that line and bully and and kind of get under the skin, you know, like a, a Jalen Ramsey without the skill, without the true true skill. Well, he he's a bu- he's meant to be a bully. You want him up on the line. You want him pestering the receiver, not to the point of getting penalties, but like me and Shane said, I would rather him get a, a penalty ten yards because he was being too aggressive at the line than being burned right, and so losing us fifteen or twenty yards. I wanted to to, to talk about this later, but. I disagree with you on this fact. He's he's not a cornerback. He's a safety. Rasul Douglas should be a safety. So if this is Rodney McLeod's last year, Rasul Douglas, which eh, who knows, it could be, uh, um, he needs to move to safety. I'm not the only one that says this. You know, the godfather of Philadelphia football, Ray Dittinger, said the same thing. 
R- Rasul Douglas doesn't have the foot speed to be a cornerback. He is very physical. He can tackle. He needs to be a safety. So I don't understand why. If they cross-train all these guys, that, that they cross-train Avante Maddox. That's it. I don't know, understand why they don't do the same with Rasul because Rasul Douglas will, would make an outstanding safety. He he can be he can come up he'll, he can play the run and do all this other stuff. I just don't think he can cover receivers. He he can't do it. And I think until we start realizing that he's and the more he gets out because he started this week even though there was all the talk that Sidney Jones was going to be the starter and the first defensive play of the game it was Rasul Douglas. I'm not mad at that. I don't care who gets the starter because I know they're all going to play. But after seeing how he plays ten yards off, which I don't know if that's him not trusting his speed or if that's the system. It's probably a little bit of both. I think it's the system because he's not the only one playing I, that I distance that. off. Yeah, I get that. But I, I think that if they were smart, they would move him to safety. I'm not going to deny that. You know what? If you're going to use him as a corner, you can't use, use him as a corner playing 10 yards off. I, I mean, he by the time someone makes – the play to get by him, they will get by him if he's playing 10 yards off. He has to be able to play up there and be physical, and he might get burned, but I think he'd get burned a lot less if he's able to be physical and up on the line. Um, but I don't deny that a move to safety would probably be beneficial, and we'd probably see the best for Sewell Douglas at safety. Wow. I, but, I expected a little bit more fight back from that. Jeez. <laughs> I, I mean, well, I mean, it's it's obvious because he's aggressive. He's physical. Yeah. Who do you yeah. want as a safety? You want a guy who's going to make that tackle, who's gonna, not a Darby who's going to stick his head down and miss half his tackles. You want like you want a Rasul Douglas at safety to make those tackles. And I mean, I like him where he is, and I think give him a chance to give like let Jim Schwartz get confident with his safeties enough to say or his corners to say move up a little bit move up don't give less padding be more aggressive at the line so frustrating whenever we see them come out and all the time playing 10 yards off if i'm a quarterback you know i'm looking over i'm like just give me a hitch just give me a hitch because we'll take five yards every play you know the one thing that i know or that the play of the quarterbacks kind of told me was they need jalen mills which I don't know if any a lot of people were saying, but when Jalen Mills yeah, comes yeah, back, yeah, I was going to say like when ouch, he comes like, back, what? <laughs> when Jalen Mills comes back, he is a starter. We see it. Avante Maddox is in the slot. I, again, they put Sidney Jones in the slot, and I don't understand why they do that. He is not a slot corner. That bothered me. But when Jalen Mills is healthy, which apparently by all accounts he's healthy now, could probably play, but obviously can't come back till week six. He, they love Jalen Mills for some reason. I have no idea why. Yeah, he was the starter of the Super Bowl team, Super Bowl defense. But, you know, we know he, he gives up big plays. But do not be shocked week six when he is back or after week six when he is back that Jalen Mills is inserted as long as his, you know, condi- as long as he's physically fit, as long as uh, his conditioning is good, that he's a starter on this team. And, you know, I don't know if that's what that says about the other corners, but he is a very big part of this defense for the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, I agree. Um, he he's he I feel like I mean, yes, he gets burned a lot and he gives up some big plays, but I feel like he's the only corner in Jim Schwartz's defense that actually can play off 10 yards and successfully do it. Yeah, like, you would think he, that like a Darby could because Darby has the speed, but he can't do it either. I, I think Darby, I don't. I mean, I don't want to say like it's his football IQ, but it's I feel like it's his football, it's his football IQ, IQ or something. <laughs> he just can't he can't read a play, he can't see a play, he can't make the play. He doesn't have that split second decision making, and that's why we're giving him the one year prove it deal. Prove to us that you can be that cornerback. Prove to us that you can be that number one. And if game one's any indication, well, one year's all he's getting in Philly, or he's taking a big old pay cut. But, I mean, the corners were definitely a big concern and point for me. I also found, and well, I guess the Malik Jackson news doesn't help, but that the defensive line was pretty underwhelming, especially up against the Washington Redskins offense, who's without their best offensive lineman. I thought we would have feasted a lot more. And Only we talked one about, sack. And, yeah, and we talked about that one Derek Barnett play and stuff. It just felt like the, offense, the defensive line was just not, not there. They weren't all there. They weren't. They weren't in midseason form, which I guess you can't expect from from game one. But I mean, they just they underwhelmed completely. The pressure didn't feel there. I mean, they 
Keenum threw for 380 yards. And yes, you can throw partial blame on the secondary that was getting roasted, but you can also throw that on the defensive line not applying enough pressure. Case Keenum got comfortable. And we know when Case Keenum can get comfortable, he can be he can be an okay quarterback. And he showed it. He can be an okay cornerback when he's comfortable, but he shouldn't have been comfortable behind that line. It's bad when you say that. And then he had that type of game, knowing the quarterbacks that are, the Eagles are about to face, Matt Ryan, Matt Stafford, Aaron Rodgers. They get Tom Brady later in the year. Uh, yeah, that's that's a little worrisome, if you ask me. Especially now losing Jackson. I mean, I don't know much about this uh, with Akeem Spence, but um, I mean, I'm excited. He played 16 games. He stayed healthy. So, I mean, if he's going to push the line, yeah, By that's all means, sh- welcome to the team. It's such a shame what happened to, to Malik Jackson. And it happened in the fourth quarter, if I'm not mistaken. Like, it's he was poised, like, the, he was the big free agent acquisition. Um, he was poised to, to have a flourish next to, to Fletcher Cox. It's fortunate that the Eagles were able to bring Tim Jernigan back because we know what type of player, when he's healthy, he can be a devastating force inside. We saw it back in 2017 when he was healthy, and him and Fletcher Cox ruled the middle. Um, but when it comes to the defensive ends, this is where the Eagles missed the boat or how we missed the boat. They should have traded for Jadavion Clowney. Clowney would make a huge difference on this team. We saw what Seattle gave up. They gave up Arcavius Mingo. A They swapped picks, if I'm not mistaken, and it's somebody yep. else who played the two the two guys that the, the the Seahawks gave up played a total of like 10 snaps for the for the Houston Texans in their game Monday night against New Orleans. So like, and, and Jadavian Clowney had a sack, you know, Howie Roseman and Eagles missed the boat on that one. I don't care if, you know, you have to give up something. And even, even if it's only a one year rental, he would make a monumental difference on this defensive line and would help get pressure. Because as you mentioned, they didn't get much pressure from the ends. You know, Brandon Graham, as good of a defensive end as he is, he's more of a run-stopping defensive end than he is a pass-rushing defensive end. And Derek Barnett's supposed to be that pass-rushing defensive end, but he's all coming back from injury. We don't know what he's going to be able to do. He's in the third the third year. Um, excuse me, he's in his third year, and this is supposed to be, you know, approve it. Let's go. You need to show us that you belong in the NFL or else, you know, we'll let you walk in a couple years because, you know, in order, I, the best way to help the secondary is to get pressure on the quarterback. And with the quarterbacks that we are facing and the receivers that we are facing coming up, that front four has to get to the quarterback. Absolutely. I mean, one positive is Derek Barnett did have three QB hits. So, I mean, he got there, but he got there too late. So he's got to show maybe that was just the shaking off that first game. But, Hopefully. I mean, he's got to he's got to stick into the against- quarterback. We need that. We need that like 10 sack. 15 sack prediction to to come true for Derek Barnett. We really yeah, need I, him to prove it. Yeah, and they're going up against another offensive line that's banged up. You know, we'll talk about it later this week when we get into the the Falcons preview. But you know, that offensive line lost their starting center to a broken foot, so they're another offensive line that that's banged up. But Matt Ryan's another quarterback that likes to get rid of the ball, and with the offensive weapons he has on the outside, and Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, Muhammad Sanu, I would get the ball to them quickly. I, especially against the if secondary. You, if you saw Keenum get the ball out the way he did this past game, the you guy watch. to McLaurin, yeah. Thompson, Davis, imagine yeah. what you're going to do with Devontae Freeman, uh, Austin Hooper, uh, cool. the Jones, Julio. Ridley, like you said. Like, like if you're watching, you're the, uh, Ryan could feast. Yeah, if you're watching, we'll talk about it later this week, but if you're watching that, the, the Eagles defensive film, if you're Matt Ryan, you're looking at Julio going, bro, that middle of the field? We are exposing that. Like, if you have nope. if you have Julio in fantasy this week, he's a good start. I just traded him for Derrick Henry in one of my leagues, and boys, is he ever so somebody, is he ever my top receiver? Are ready? So wait, you have Julio now? I, I not in not in our league. I'm in I'm in eight well, leagues, man. Know, you gotta so, remember, take it with a great self. Yeah, I know. Like, did you? Tra- yeah, but you just talked about a trade. Whatever trade you made, you traded Julio for Henry, or you traded Henry? No, no, for Julio? I traded Henry for Julio. Wow. Whoever accepted that trade's an idiot. Somebody offered me. All right, so you're the fantasy. Somebody offered me Julio Jones for Travis Kelsey. I have Travis Kelsey. He was gonna. He was willing to do a straight up Julio for Travis Kelsey deal. What do you think? Man, it depends who's out there for free agency, man. Because if you can find like their tight ends are. Down. I have Delaney I, Wal- Delaney Walker's my backup. Delaney Walker, and if you can go out, if Darren Waller's still out there, oh, he is gonna feast in I think Oakland. Somebody has him because I I have Waller in our league. 
Oh, by the way, congratulations, you beat me. I'm I know I was going to wait till the end to brag, yeah, nah, but, nah, but nah, I mean, nah, nah. if you want to, if you want to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you beat me this week. No, nobody on my team did anything. It was bad. And it, and you didn't even start Lamar. Don't you have Lamar Jackson? I do, even, I do. I do. I dropped start. the ball. I missed out on like 25 points because I picked Cam you, Newton, you, for God's sakes. You still beat me by like 20 points. So it is what it is. It happens. We'll see each other again later in the year. But, yes, sir. Uh, all right, so let's move. We've talked about the bad. A lot of the bad was the de- defense. Yeah, Actually, I was gonna say. I got, let, one, more, I can, well, I got one more bad. I got one more bad for you. Hold on, I got okay. one more bad. The first half play calling by Doug Peterson. It seemed like the entire offense. We mentioned it when I was when we were going over the scoring plays. That the entire first half was the preseason for the Eagles offense. Even Doug Peterson, they they were. I don't want to say they were out of sync, but but like some of the play calls. On third and one, why are you pitching it outside to Darren Sproles? That made zero sense to me. You have Jordan Howard, who was averaging seven yards a carry, who has the most, if not if not or if not the most, second most yards after contact. You you line up in a, not even an eye, you just line up with him in the backfield, hand him the ball, let him go forward. He'll fall forward for that yard. I don't understand the play calling, but Doug Peterson definitely turned it around in the second half. Oh, yeah, it was too, it felt too conservative. It felt too, like, I'm ready to let Wentz go, but just not yet, not yet, not yet. Like, he, like, eased it's into like letting Carson back. Wentz yeah. go and the whole letting him just be Carson Wentz. And we saw it in the second half. I think he, he did, like, three QB sneaks on very similar short situations where he decided to do a pitch out in the first half. So, I mean, definitely... Definitely did didn't get the bugs out in the preseason, but that first half, that was that was pretty ugly play calling. It was too conservative. It was too he wasn't letting Wentz go except for that one throw to Deshaun Jackson. It it was it was hard to watch. I was like, man, if he's going to oh. call plays like this all all game, we are getting eaten alive. If we, let's put it this way: if we faced any other team, not one of the five or six worst teams in the NFL, it would have been ugly. But my thing is, he, it felt like so all preseason, all camp, they were trying to get uh, Carson Wentz to stay in the pocket, and it felt like he was calling plays for that. But now let's go to the positive. When they finally, or when Carson finally started moving around, he doesn't have the brace on anymore. We know what type of vision he has. You know, when he finally started to move around, things started to open up for the offense, and Doug Peterson finally mm-hmm. got his groove back. And that second half, especially that third quarter, was a thing of beauty. It felt like he was still calling for Nick Foles, but minus a whole bunch of RPOs. But they kind of felt like that because he just protect Foles, keep him in the pocket. It felt like he he hadn't yet accustomed to the fact that, oh, I got Carson Wentz back as as my quarterback. You know, mm-hmm. it, it just felt like he was calling it like he had a completely different quarterback than he did. But then yeah, it's you like saw somebody called down and I'm like, hey, 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 Doug, you have you, you know you have Carson and not Nick, right? Nick just yeah, got hurt. So it's like, like somebody it's like somebody said that. Which, by the way, I mean I feel terrible about that injury. Right? That, he has zero luck outside horrible. of Philly. He I has know, no but I mean, luck outside in, of Philly. In all in all honesty, just quick off topic, they didn't set him up for success in in Jacksonville. You want to set him up for success, you get him a good tight end, you get him a good offensive line. He, he had his favorite receiver picked out. D.D. Westbrook was going to go off this that, year. He, that Nick was a Ford. hell. That was a hell of a throw getting hit. Like he threw. He you couldn't have handed it off better. To, was that Westbrook that caught that, or was that? I think it was. I think like he, you, it was Westbrook there too. Yeah, you couldn't have handed that off any better. And like, it is a shame. Like he has, as mentioned, we saw what happened when he was with the Rams. He just has zero luck outside of Philly. You know. He he might be good in Jacksonville. Who knows? But you're right. They didn't set him up for success with the weapons and with that offensive line that they have around him. Now back back there. Let's get to some positive Eagles yeah, stuff. Yeah. Now yeah. now now that we said sorry to Nick Foles, but you're not an Eagle <laughs> anymore, so you don't take up our show. <laughs> yeah. So uh, well, um, you, Deshaun, you Deshaun Jackson. Positive. There we go. Deshaun Jackson obviously was a huge positive. The run defense mm. was a positive. They the the, the Redskins couldn't run the ball. Nope. Thompson had what seven carries for ten yards or something like yeah, that. I'm looking. Darius they had thirteen Dar- carries for twenty eight yards. Darius Darius guys uh, got hurt. He he uh, might have torn his meniscus. I think he had surgery. So you know, it, 
the run defense was really good. And uh, but again, when you, you you see what Case Keenum was able to do, why would you run the ball? Just throw the ball all over the field. Um, yep. The offensive line. Jason Peters played every play. Brandon Brooks played 55 snaps, and they had him on a on a pitch count. They said he was only going to play 30. He came back from Achilles – and Achilles injuries is, is a career threatener for a guy of his size. He came back from that injury, played – could have played in the entire eight months. game. In, in eight, eight months. months. The, the offensive line did not – I don't think they gave up a sack, if I'm remembering correctly – and, I see one sack here, one, one okay. sack for zero yards. And, so. Yeah, so that was – and they had no penalties until Vitae game in the game in the fourth quarter. Like that – and and there, there was a um a thing, a video going around, which I posted on Twitter or I commented or retweeted on Twitter, I should say, of Lane Johnson pretty much body sla- – not body slamming, but taking Ryan Kerrigan to the ground. Like the offensive line was masterful – on Sunday. And that Absolutely. if that offensive line plays like that, Carson Wentz is going to have all day. I mean, yeah, if you, if you have that like that offensive line and then that offensive production through four quarters, man, we're going he's going to be putting up like 50 points every game. Like yeah, that offensive line was good and Brandon Brooks, I think PFF ranked him out as one of the best offensive linemen. Jason Peters and, was the best tackle like Yep. It, it was amazing at what the the offensive line, which played what a, a quarter if that together in the preseason. Somebody coming back from a major injury, um, Lane Johnson coming back from an injury. Like it was amazing what that offensive line did, showing why they are the best offensive line in football. We we knew what we had with them, but I feel like they're even a step up this year because like even like Lane Johnson, like he was. He was maybe it's a fact. Maybe they're all confident because of their ESPN body issue and their <laughs> feature in that. But I mean, it feels like they're like a step up even from last year. Like Lane Johnson body slamming people. We saw that last year, but man, like that. Speaking, that of, that, vicious. speaking, of, that, speaking of that ESPN issue, Lane Johnson is jacked. Like. An he does not lineman, look like an offensive right? lineman. That looks like a tight end or something. Like an off- an off- <laughs> he was a quarterback back in the day. He went to Oklahoma, I'm pretty sure, as a quarterback. If I'm a, not short, a short, chubby tight end, but a fairly physical, but, a fairly fit tight end. Like, look at him. He has like a six pack. He's over 300 pounds. That shouldn't happen. Like, it's amazing how this guy looks on the. You man, know, I can't even. I can't issue. even get a six pack, and I'm 130 pounds. Like, man, <laughs> there's no fat here. Like, I, I have a six pack, but it's a six pack of beer, not a. Six pack. <laughs> <laughs> I feel but, you. I feel you. It's great, like, man. But you're right. Maybe that did give them some confidence. But they were outstanding, and that's another positive for me. You have any other, any more positives? Yeah, I mean, I guess you kind of hit on it. Um, Deshaun Jackson was definitely a positive. Um, nice to, to see the way Carson went spread the ball around. I mean, Jackson had nine targets, Ertz seven, Jeffrey seven, Aguilar five, then three to Goddard, Sproles, Howard. Like, there, you so can see he's really – there's so many weapons, and you can tell Carson Wentz is the right quarterback to give those weapons to because he's going to spread the ball around. He's spreading the ball around already after one game, and that that's definitely a huge plus – um, I guess the running game, not, not like beyond Darren Sproles, there wasn't a huge lot, a huge, a whole lot to be excited about, but use Jordan Howard more. I mean, that man, especially in short yardage, six carries, 44 yards, 7.3 average, like that, those situations you can use, you can take a short yard situation and he probably turn it into 10 or 15 yards for you. You gotta use him. I know that you got like Sanders and Sproles and you're like, oh, and how do you spread the love? But I mean, I think it starts with you don't need to let, give Sproles nine carries a game and Howard six. Yeah. You didn't well, bring <laughs> Howard in to to ride the pine here. One thing I noticed is Doug Peterson loves Darren Sproles. Like, remember Love. last year? Remember last year when he was hurt for the what, eight nine weeks? When he, the first game he came back, they gave him the ball like fifteen times. I felt like so like he he is so high on Darren Sproles. It's amazing. Like I don't, I get it. We all love Darren Sproles, but you have two young horses that you can ride all year. Ride, ride them. Let them, let them do, do their thing. I mean, Miles Sanders showed some burst on that touchdown run, which shouldn't have been called back, 
which we mentioned earlier. And and Jordan Howard moved the piles upon piles upon piles. Like, just I let them go out the, and do their thing. You saw the stats for Jordan Howard. I mean, he's one of the best running backs from a st- statistical standpoint in the last, like, four or five years. So you got to feed that man the ball. That guy's not a guy who who's going to produce on four or five carries. He needs like 10, 11, 12 carries, and he will give you 100-yard efforts. He will push that pile, and he showed it. Six carries, 44 yards. Imagine you double that. You're at 12 carries for 88 yards, and I don't doubt that 12 carries would get him 100 yards. So, I mean, you got to give him the opportunity to, to really to push that pile and to prove it and use Sproles for what he is. He's your change of pace back. He's not your every down push the pile back. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting um, this upcoming week, which we're going to talk about it, you know, later on in the week. But against the Atlanta Falcons, the Minnesota Vikings threw the ball 10 times and ran it a lot. Like the Falcons are going to see a totally different type of offense unless Doug, Doug Peterson decides to do what he doesn't like to do. And that means and running, go, lean on the running game. But they had the horses up front. They had the horses in the backfield that if they want to run the ball, on that small defensive front of the Falcons, they will be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I can't wait to dig into that game. Oh, yeah, it's going to be fun. The Eagles are 1-0, tied with the Dallas Cowboys in the division. If they demolish the Giants, who may be the second worst team in the NFL behind the Miami Dolphins, who are the worst team in the NFL. Oh, it's they're they're bad. That is, that was I love, okay, I love Lamar Jackson. And Lamar Jackson, I think, is going to be a great quarterback. Maybe not great, but he's going to be a really good quarterback. I did not expect the, the Dolphins are 19 and a half point underdogs to the Patriots this upcoming week. I don't think there's I know, ever I been saw a line. that breakout as a like, oh man. I don't know. Like if somebody puts money on that, puts money on the Dolphins, and the Dolphins somehow cover it and or win, who we? And it's that's a, a divisional game, man. I'd be willing to in, go. Well, and if it's I'm, in Miami. If I'm pick, listen, if I'm picking, like, they, let's not forget the Miami Miracle. I mean, the game, the team was better. But, I mean, like, I'd probably put money on the under. I'd probably put money on the Dolphins well, and, to, and to get that spread. The Patriots usually don't play well in Miami either. So, no, it's, Tom it's Brady really, loves his cold weather. This is too soon. It's very tempting to take the Dolphins in this spot. But the Dolphins are t- t- tanking. For Tua, or you know, whoever they want to lose for. <laughs> what? But I mean, you could still go for the spread. I, I wouldn't pick them as a you know win pick them. But I I try and I right? take them on the spread. Yeah. You think it'd be another backdoor like the Redskins? How many people do you think were mad in that state? Did you hear? Did you hear all the groans in the stadium when the the Redskins scored with six seconds left because it went from a twelve point lead down to a five point lead and the spread was ten and a half. Yeah, I know. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I just celebrate the win. Who the hell cares about your pro line? I know, your, I know. I just, thought, I, just, I just thought it was funny that I, I was like, man, the Eagles are going to find a way to like backdoor, backdoor cover this game after being down 17. And then here comes the Redskins going down the field on that picket fence of the Eagles defense, the prevent defense, and scoring with six seconds left. Like they, oh, it was it was ridiculous. It's just like it's just like fantasy people who sit there and they're like, oh man, I look like they get uh, yeah, all up, they get all upset because like, oh man, the Eagles shut down Darius Geis and I have Geis in fantasy. It's like who the hell cares, yeah, man? Eagles Are you an Eagles fan or what? Yeah, that is funny. Um, uh, I love fantasy except I hate losing, so uh, I hate you right now. No, I'm <laughs> I won my other one. I won that one by like seventy points, so I'm happy with that. Because that, you were focused on that one. That's why I have Antonio TV, Brown so. in that. So, like, I had to figure out. So, I ended up drafting Tyrell Williams, too. So, I put in Williams, and he uh, he had a big day. So, I'm happy. He went off, man. That's uh, You got a Jacobs, Williams, and Waller, man. Wise Jacobs, investments. Speaking of Jacobs, he's going to be good. I don't care what anybody says. There's an Alabama running back that's going to be good. I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I have a buddy who's a huge Raiders fan, so I love to see the Raiders fail just for him. <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, like Jacobs, he's got he's got some legit talent. So he really does. All right. Uh, so the Eagles winning win, uh, winning their season opener. They are four and zero under Doug Peterson in season openers, by the way. And this past Sunday was the first uh, season op- first first. Let me try to like. Let me back up. It was take the first time. time 
that Carson Wentz has not led a touchdown drive in his first drive of the season. He did it the previous three years, didn't do it this year. I was hoping to see that continue. Uh, but, you know, they had to get a little bit of rust off in the first half. Absolutely. I mean, if you if if they had to went for a full game, like, man, you might have seen Carson Wentz put up 500 yards. But, Carson of Wentz, course, he, he, he didn't, looks healthy. He didn't play in the preseason, just saying. So <laughs> had to true. shake that rust off somewhere, right? That's true. As like Reese says, let the Bronco buck. I can't wait to start this, uh, diving into this Atlanta Falcons game this week. We'll do that uh, later in the week. Uh, it's a busy week for both of us. Uh, we have Which is like tomorrow night because it's, yeah. it's Thursday. So yeah, whatever. Um, we'll give you something we, to listen to on the weekend. Yeah. And we have the people's take because there's a, another pay-per-view for the WWE this week. So, uh, yeah, we have a we have a busy week. Uh, uh, busy week ahead of us there, uh, my friend. Absolutely. But I love a busy week. That's true. All right. This segment was brought to you by Just Food Catering Services. Go visit our friend Rob. And you treat yourself, take it home. You can give them a call at 215-794-FOOD. That's 215-794-3663. Or visit his website at www.jfcatering.com. For Connor, who can be reached at Connor10, that's Connor T-E-N. I'm the host, LJ Harrell. You can reach me at LJ Harrell54. I'm trying to get to 100 Twitter followers. I'm at 91 right now, so uh, help oh a brother Lord, out. Oh, Lord, man. I'm trying to I get don't... to 1,700. I'm at like 1,662, so help right, a brother well, out. <laughs> and you can reach us at the Always Next Year Podcast Twitter, at ANY Podcast. For Connor, I'm LJ. We're going to send it out to the Jack Dolls. As we will be back tomorrow or later on in the week, whatever, to get you set for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Atlanta Falcons week two of the NFL season. Thank you. Fly, Eagles, fly. A fighting man I used to be, revered and feared through Killarney. Now I'm back to hitching me and throwing. But if Mickey Flynn should ever fight me, I'll throw me call shit all behind me and square off on that son of a bitch again. He cracked a bit of river too. Dumb and lame.